I have to say good evening and they have to say it back. Is that how it works? Okay. Good evening. Good evening. Wow, that was so exciting. Thank you so much for having me. Uh, my name is Beth Prindle. I'm curator of the Adams Library at the Boston Public Library, and I am very proud to have been asked to speak here at Drake University. And it has been almost a year in the making, I believe, Claudia. Is that correct? Claudia came to Boston when um, Drake was chosen as one of the sites for the Adams Library exhibition. Uh, all of the sites sent one person to Boston to learn not only about the collection and the basic things of how to set up and take down um, the panels that you see behind you, but also to learn a little bit more background about Adams, his life, and his books. So this, it is really wonderful for me to be here. And I understand I have three hours. Is that? <laughs> Three and a half? Great, okay. Um, so we better get cracking. Um, to start, the collection itself is the collection primarily of one man, but it also represents the collecting of a family because this is considered John Adams's personal library, but to assume that he's the only person who ever touched, read, thought about these books would be to discount the entire Adams family um, that was both contemporary to him and then the Adamses that would follow. The collection that I work with um, is a collection of about 3,500 books. And think about that in modern times. Think about someone you know owning 3,500 books today in the age of Amazon, in the age of cheap trade paperback, in the age of Barnes and Noble, and then envision what it is like to collect over 3,000 books in a time where the vast majority of the population is illiterate. Books are enormously expensive. Books are rare. And they are certainly something that in that era were very few of those books were ones that were commonly found at your corner bookshop. It required some serious looking. Um, so for John Adams, now the guy lived forever. I mean, he was 90 years old when he died. On what famous date? July 4th, 1826, the same date as Thomas Jefferson. I mean, you couldn't write that. I'm sorry, if you put that in a movie, that you have the two lions of the American Republic die 50 years after the Declaration of Independence on the same day, and the last words out of Adams's mouth were, Jefferson survives. Not realizing, of course, that Jefferson had died a few hours earlier. This is before the age of email and telephones. And it is, they are men that are inexorably linked. Um, I did give a warning when I spoke to a class this morning that those of you who have very strong Jeffersonian leanings, you are welcome to have them, but you're also welcome to remain silent until I'm done speaking. Um, that said, Adams and Jefferson had an extraordinary relationship, and it's one that was very much built um, on a shared love of books, and the relationship with his family, both John Quincy, who's in the upper corner there as a youth when they were living in Europe, and Abigail, who read extensively from this library. Um, this was a family that was built of books. I, met, I talked to someone at the Quincy National Historical Park, which is the homestead of the Adams family, and she said to me, probably the most telling indication of what she thought was important to the Adamses. She said the Adamses loved paper. And if you think about it, it really does hold true. This is a letter writing family. This is a reading family. They were not interested in material objects. They were interested in the life of the mind and communicating through both letters, but also the communication through that shared love of reading and of books. This is where I go to work. This is the Boston Public Library. It is in Copley Square. Have any of you seen this building in real life? It's an extraordinary building. It was built in 1895, but the Boston Public Library has been around much longer than that. It was founded in 1848 as the first large free municipal library in the country. We have above our doors, it's, a, it's hard to see, but above that central arch walking into that building are three words. It says, free to all. And that is the mission by which this institution operates. And I think it is extraordinarily fitting that this is the place where Adams's books are currently housed. This building is known as the McKim Building because it was designed by Charles Fallon McKim. 
um, a very famous architect. This particular building um, houses now what we call our research library, but the Boston Public Library itself, there's another building next door which houses our circulating collection. Between this library and the building next door, that's a million square feet of library occupying an entire city block, and then we have 26 branches around the city. We're a big institution. What you also should know is that the Adams Library is not the only collection that we have in our special collections. Um, we have probably about 20 million items at the BPL, and in our special collections alone, the figures I hear most often we have, and the, the department where I work, work, work rare books, about 500,000 rare books, about a million manuscripts, in music, we have about 96,000 scores. We have over 100,000 architectural drawings, about 100, 125,000 prints and drawings, 1.5 million photographs. It's a big collection. But I would still say of all of those items, which include everything from Gutenberg to Shakespeare's first folio, that the Adams Library really is considered to be the crown jewel of the BPL's collection. So this is where it is most of the time, and it doesn't look particularly impressive, I know, to you. This is the rare books department at the Boston Public Library. You walk in, actually, when you come into the library, you enter through those doors. Um, you try not to run into my friend Tom there, who is, in fact, um, head of our digital services and runs our digital initiatives. But you proceed to the front desk where anyone, anyone in this room is welcome to fill out a library card application. You would hand over then a form of identification, and you would hand over all of your stuff. We will take away your hats, we will take away your coats, we will take away your bags, we will take away your pens, we will take away any notebooks you have that have paper that is not loose, and we will put them into lockers for you. And then, with your computer out of its case, and your camera out of its bag, you are welcome to go into our rare books reading room, anyone. And we will bring you the world. It is behind a locked door. It is fully uh, staffed at all times with a librarian who will stare at you. Um, and it has a security camera that keeps track 24 seven. But it also means that we will bring you whatever you want that is of use to you from our collections. And that to me is one of the greatest gifts of that library is that you wanna see a letter signed by Napoleon, we will bring it. You wanna see a first edition of a volume um, by Robert Louis Stevenson, we will bring it. You want to see an Abigail Adams letter, we will bring it. You want to hold an Adams book, we will bring it. And that is, for me, the native Southern Californian where these sorts of things don't exist, um, with the exception of a few private libraries, this is one of the great gifts. The Boston Public Library is one of the five great research libraries in the country, along with New York Public, Harvard, Yale, and of course, the Library of Congress, which is the largest library in the world. This is the Rare Books Reading Room. This is where between nine and five, Monday through Friday, scholars work with the Adams materials. But we realized that that was sort of a limiting, that was, that was a very limiting opportunity to interact with these books. And so, what happened in the last 10 years is primarily due, I think, in no small, small part to that man in the upper right corner. Do you know who that is? David McCullough. And David McCullough, who wrote his landmark book, John Adams, which by the way, I was speaking with some people over dinner, was not originally the title. The title was supposed to, the, the topic was supposed to include Adams and Jefferson. And he realized that there was so much information on Adams alone that partway through, he, had, he decided that Adams was worthy of the treatment and he could only handle that much material. And the book that came out in 2001, John Adams, caught everybody by surprise. Most especially those of us who, who work in this arena. There was, for a man who has traditionally been considered kind of the also-ran among the founding fathers, people were shocked when all of a sudden this massive swell of public interest in Adams surfaced. You add then the HBO miniseries, which just came out last year, I believe, all of a sudden we have seen interest in Adams that has been unparalleled in the nearly 200 years since his death. And what that enabled us to do was to think big, that maybe people really did want to see this collection. And one of the first things we did was build a temporary gallery exhibition and bring the books down for the 100 years that we've had the library at the BPL. We had never put it on public display. 
So the first thing we did was build this exhibition, John Adams Unbound. It went up in September 2006, and that book wall was built for that exhibition. It's 14 feet high, it's 40 feet long, and if you look at it, if you see the people in front of it, they're literally dwarfed by the books. There is something extraordinary about standing in front of that book wall and realizing just how many darn books that man really, really collected. It is mind-blowing, and if you think about it from the perspective of DC, there's no monument to Adams in Washington. He, until the dollar coins came out with the presidents, he wasn't on any money. And frankly, everybody's going to get to be on one of those. Even Polk's going to get to have one of his dollar coins. So we couldn't take too much satisfaction in that. But there is a movement afoot to put a library, to put a monument in D.C. And the foundation that is undertaking that is choosing to make it in the form of a library. And I cannot imagine, frankly, anything that would be more fitting. And the monument would honor not only Abigail, but would also honor, or not only John, but also Abigail and John Quincy because they're very much part of that story as well. The exhibition was extraordinary because it allowed us, you try moving 3,500 rare books from the third floor of a building and getting them down through an 1895 building carefully and keeping track of all of them. People would be sort of upset if you lost one of the Adams books on the way or dropped it. Getting them installed in that book wall, sealed in tight, and then we took out about 70 of the volumes and opened them up where people could actually see them and read them and look at them and, and be exposed to them. And it didn't require somebody coming in and finding us. We instead put them out there where people could find them. And what really shocked us was that people came. Who knew? We're a public library. We hand out library cards. We shush you. We don't do museum quality exhibitions. And for us to have the response, 55,000 people came with little publicity at all because we couldn't afford it. I mean, that for us was the mind-blowing experience. People really did want to see it. And what happened as a result of that, in fact, some of the people who saw that encouraged us, you need to take this nationally. Well, you can't. It's kind of hard to pack up 3,500 rare books and ship them around the country. They tend not to like that that much. And so we did what is was our best effort for this time, which was to offer you, in this exhibition that we have here in this room, a small taste of what it is, but I'm going to show you a taste as well of how you can continue that experience online. So we're going to start here with our little magical mystery journey. We're starting here at the birthplace of not just one, but two presidents who happen to be right next door to one another. John Adams was born in the Red House on the right in what was then Braintree, Massachusetts, in 1735. His son, John Quincy Adams, sixth president of the United States, was born in the house on the left, which is where John and Abigail lived when they were first married. And both houses stand today. They are almost uh, empty of furnishings, but there is a wonderful, wonderful family home in Quincy that's filled with all things Adams. But this is where it starts, and this is where John Adams' career with books starts. books start as well. And I have to say, it's not a likely career. You would think for a guy who collects 3,500 books that he is the one who comes out of the womb and asks for something to read. And it's exactly opposite. He hated to read. He didn't like school. He didn't like his teacher. He, his father was a farmer. Um, he wanted to farm. His father could read and write. Um, there probably weren't very many books in the house. He certainly wasn't college educated. His mother was probably illiterate. This isn't a family household filled with books. Adams wanted to stay home and farm. And his father had different plans for him and said, I will get you a new teacher, but you need to keep at this. And what happened, miraculously, was that the boy who did not love books somehow blossomed between that age of 13 to by the time he was 16 or 17, really starting to show an interest. This is probably, this is one of the most famous books in the collection, and to look at it, you would look at it and say, what is that ratty looking thing? It's small. It looks pretty big when it's up on the screen, but the book itself is about this big. It's John Adams' copy of Cicero. He's got a lot of copies of Cicero, so why this one is particularly famous is not because it is a particularly rare copy or that it is a, or an ornate 
copy. It is the copy that is important to us because it has a signature in that upper right corner that says John Adams's book, 1749-1750. He was 14 years old. And to have a book that dates from his early schooling, and for us, the wonder of it is not necessarily the printed contents, but as it is with so many of the books in this collection, it is with the interaction of its owner. And he's such a kid when he uses this book. If he could write his name in it once, why not write it in six times in varying sizes in varying and with varying styles? Why not forget to, to blot your pen particularly well before you do it and drag your hand across it? Why not get bored and trace the title? as you're trying to occupy some time. Loan it to a friend from Harvard. Says uh, his friend Whittemore of, of Cambridge in 1751 and get it back. Write your name in it again on the next page. Write your name on the previous page. Write February 22nd, which is significant in that, if you remember I said 1749 slash 1750, the calendar is changing during this period. Literally the calendar is changing from the Julian to the Gregorian. And the first of the year is moving from March to January. So if you, are if you are at February, if you're gauging it by the old calendar, you're still in 1749. The year's not going to change until March. But if you're go going by this newfangled Gregorian thing, the first of the year changed in January. Well, he's got both of that. He also has this Latin prescription that essentially says, I'm writing my name in my book so that it comes back to me. He doesn't include the second half, which basically says, let the head fall off of the person who doesn't give it back. So thank God that friend Woodmore gave it back. What we didn't know until we cleaned it, mended it, this book was completely disbound. David and McCullough himself paid for the conservation of this book. One book alone ran about $5,000. It was completely disbound. If you ever want to see the most violent, horrible thing you've ever seen in your life, particularly if you're a curator of a collection, watch a conservator rip a book's spine apart and take the book apart. It is horrible. It makes this violent wrenching noises. The page, it, is, it is like watching an ax murder. And so having this book taken apart was terrifying. Having him wash the pages was even more terrifying because you have to test to make sure the ink doesn't migrate, but it's still a scary, scary experience to literally watch the pages float and pray that the annotations don't float with it. But it has to be done because paper from this time period, it's not wood pulp, it's, fat, it's literally cloth. It is either cotton, rag, linen, or it's linen. Um, what they do to stiffen up rag paper is that they put in a substance that gives it uh, firm quality, often gelatin. When old Dobbin was not feeling so great and went off to his reward, willingly or not, um, they often used the gelatin from the hooves, for instance, to size the paper. Well, what happens with that, not surprisingly 200 years later, is that it gets older, it gets smellier, and it gets browner. So when you clean that off, it's amazing how much whiter the paper gets. But what we also discovered that we didn't expect is in the lower corner, and you won't be able to see, see it here, there were pencil marks that we'd never seen because the paper was so dirty. And they say, J.Q. Adams, C. Adams, and T. Adams, his sons, John Quincy, Charles, and Thomas Boylston. So the two, the three of those boys also at some point had access to this book. And that's what I love about this collection. You know, Cicero, I'm sure he's great, not particularly um, pro or con in terms of what the content of the book is, except as from, from my perspective, how it relates to the fact that Adams loved Cicero. He loved Cicero from the very first to, he was reading Cicero right up until he died. And he was reading avidly through his late 80s. And when he couldn't read, he was having people read to him, but books that were in particularly uh, foreign languages, he had to read for himself because he was often having the women in his house read to him and they could not read those languages. He was the one still struggling through the Latin here, even when his eyes were going. And that is the wonderful thing, how these books have fit through that, uh, through that history. We also have his early math book. You want to see how John Adams learned math? He hated that math tutor, so what did he do? He wrote in his diary, I procured myself Cocker's Decimal Arithmetic. Now, I don't know if you can see, but it also looks like something's been cut out of the upper right corner. 
It was a signature, probably. Um, these books were on open shelves in Quincy when Adams deeded the library to the town of Quincy in 1822 for a school that was to be built. He deeded the entire collection, and the collection bounced around in six different locations until the mid-1890s. It also meant that they were subject, these books, to the predations of autograph hunters. It was very popular during this period to, for instance, to, uh, create a board that said signers of the Declaration of Independence and then find original manuscripts with all the signer's signatures, hack out the signature, paste it to your board, collect them all, and when you were done, for them, that was the artifact. For us, it's anathema. I mean, to even think about removing signatures from an original document is horrible. Um, then it was, it was perceived that the artifact itself was, was the, the combination of those signatures. We've lost about, I, I believe it's 80 to 90 of, of the signatures in the upper corners. That said, their library is amazingly intact. Um, you want to learn how John Adams learned how to extract the square root? Surprisingly, it doesn't seem all that different than it is today. Who knew? But there's something wonderfully touching about that. We think about a presidential library, and we think about it being all politics, uh, heavy on the science of government, certainly a good smattering of law, but you sometimes don't expect a lot of the personal touches to be there. You don't expect early book plates. This is a book plate. This is what the earliest known book plate owned by Adams. Um, you can see that it's very rustic in nature. It also has the 17 because he could have filled in then the second date of the year, the second two uh, figures from the year of acquisition. This particular book is in, uh, this particular book plate is in a volume of animal husbandry, not surprisingly. He's a farmer. He's a farmer from the beginning. He's a farmer to the end. When he leaves the presidency in 1801, he goes back to being a farmer for 25 years. We also have, I think, very interesting pamphlets, uh, what you wouldn't consider to be full volumes, but tell some really compelling stories. This is, of all things, a lecture on earthquakes. And this is an interesting time period in the sense Adams's professor, Don Winthrop, a descendant of the famous Governor Winthrop of Boston, is essentially the first American seismologist. He is one of the first in the country to identify earthquakes and other phenomena like it as being natural, as being uh, caused by the, having natural rather than moral or religious um, overtones. And so for Adams, what I think is really compelling is not just that he owns this. Obviously, Winthrop is his professor. That's not hugely surprising. What I find really surprising, however, is in that upper corner, Winthrop is writing here about an earthquake in 1755. John Adams, in the upper corner, writes, in March of 1761, in Quincy, Massachusetts, there's an earthquake at half past two in the morning, lasting about two minutes in duration. Now, I have reminded you once, I will remind you again, I'm a native Southern Californian. I was in the Bay Area during the 1989 Loma Prieta quake. It wasn't fun, and I now live in an unreinforced brick house in Boston. It doesn't make me feel particularly comfortable to know that, less the, that fewer than eight miles south of where I live now, there was an earthquake it doesn't seem right. There's nowhere to run. There's nowhere to hide. What is so great about this is you think about going to an Adams, going to Adams's library and learning about how he feels about government. You don't think about someone who's perhaps studying geological phenomena in the area turning to this library as well for tips on 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 early history. So we have collections at the BPL that span. Adams's life and Adams's times that are not officially part of the Adams Library, but I wanted to give you a sense of the kinds of things that we have that really, I think, fill out the picture. Uh, John Adams, bless that picture, I don't know what happened. The, the corresponding picture of Abigail during this time period, he's only in his 30s, but that hair, those cheeks, the corresponding picture of Abigail is absolutely extraordinarily lovely. Uh, this is probably my least favorite picture of him, but it is the only one we have from that period when he's serving as defense for the Boston Massacre trial. The surprising thing when we have um, school groups in, and I talk about Boston Massacres, they can't get their head around how Adams served as defense for the British. If he was someone who considered himself a patriot, how on earth could you ever have defended that act of aggression, that massacre that killed five people. And massacre is a loose definition of the term. Um, 
If there's one thing to know about John Adams, I really think that this is the turning point for him, and you would see it again and again in his reading, in his writing, in his thinking, in his political beliefs, that the rule of law had to be paramount and overcome the passions of individual men. You can't trust people. You can't trust them. Not because they're good, not because they're bad, but because they have self-interest at heart. The only way that you can ever be assured of having a fair trial, having a government that works, is by having checks and balances. And Adams felt those British soldiers deserved that trial. The, what people didn't expect was that he would actually win. So the engraving that we have on the right is one from the BPL's collections. It's a, it's the scene of the Boston Massacre trial by Paul Revere. It's pretty famous. I bet if you have ever seen the massacre in a history book, you've seen a picture of this engraving in some collection next to it. But what you don't expect in our collection is something that I think is far cooler, which is just this plain pen and ink drawing also of the massacre scene. That's King Street in the middle, um, the little circles, there's the custom house in the lower right, there are little circles with lines coming out of them which represent the British soldiers. And then there are four really graphically drawn colonists lying dead in the street. It is probably the first, it is the earliest known forensic map in American history, and it was drawn by Paul Revere. And there is a wonderful, there's a wonderful sense of the story that he's trying to craft, crack, the political propaganda. The British aren't even human, they're just guns. But the guys who are lying in the street, there are literally blood streams pouring out of them. You can see them. They're human, and it's wonderful for us to have this in conjunction with these ratty scraps of paper, which we also have. The list of commotions that evening. There are 14. They're no bigger than this. And they're filled. These are John Adams' personal trial notes from the Boston Massacre trial. He's sitting, he's listening to testimony, he's writing down witness accounts, and he is developing what would be an extraordinary defense of those soldiers, drawn heavily from the law books that he has in his collection. But, and as I explained to um, some folks earlier, I understand how art survives. And I understand how paintings and sculpture and beautiful things survive. You don't throw that in the trash. But I'm always amazed when you come across th this ephemera, because it is that, these scraps that are actually so, rather than being the rarefied expression of, of human um, endeavor, this is the stuff of daily life. And for these manuscript notes from that trial to survive, they're one of the few things that were in that courtroom. Like if they could talk, and if they could show what they had, uh, what they had seen. I mean, what an extraordinary thing. They are the witnesses in the same way that the Adams Library really does to me serve as witness. I know I completely anthropomorphize these books. I'm, I'm trying to do better. Um, but it is true. If you think of them as artifact, and if you think of them as the eyes, who have seen Abigail, who have see, heard Thomas Jefferson's voice, who were in that first White House, then all of a sudden you realize that there is an experience related to these books that is far more than the sum of, of those printed contents. The Adams Law Library is one of the biggest, Adams said even at the time it was the biggest law library in Massachusetts. Um, I bet it probably was in New England. It's not American law, of course. I don't know why that surprised me, but it, for some reason it, it took me a moment to, to process it. Of course it wasn't, because it was English common law. That's what, when Adams is practicing as a lawyer in the 1760s and 1770s, that's what he's practicing. Uh, the collection itself was one that was so popular that even when he was away, lawyers from miles around would borrow his books. And Abigail, when Adams was at the Continental Congress, and the, he, she was worried about the British soldiers coming through and burning the books, she actually took the entire library and, and squirreled it away to his brother's house in Randolph to protect it. So it's, all, it's one thing about the book itself, but what I really find amazing about this library that's charmed, because it really is charmed. I mean, so many libraries from this period, Thomas Jefferson sells his library to the Library of Congress for $25,000. He sells 6,700 books, bigger than Adams's library. 
But that library no longer stands. Why? Because there was a, there was a construction fire at the Library of Congress, and those books burned. Over half of them burned. They're replacing them. They're replacing them with exact editions. But those books never met Thomas Jefferson. They never, they, he didn't hold them. He held something very like them. Benjamin Franklin had a large library, but those li that library was dispersed. I mean, this is what happened to books during this period. They were so valuable that they dis were dispersed among heirs when you died. They were sold to pay off debts, or you put flammable paper in a wooden building and you heat it with open flame. And what you get in a lot of cases, too, too many cases, are a lot of charred libraries. Adams's library survived a fire. It survived bouncing all over the place. And not only did the books survive, the stuff shoved in the books survived. So these two manuscript notes were shoved in one of those law books that I showed you previously. The note on the left is a note from Adams's, in Adams's hand regarding a case he's working on where someone broke into the woodlot and stole away the oak tree. A real barn burner of a case, apparently, that he's working on, no, no pun intended. Um, on the right, we have notes in, uh, in John Quincy Adams's manuscript hand. And so it's so amazing to me that this kind of stuff survives. These books, people could have taken them, um, taken these things out. These pieces weren't cataloged. We found over 100 items. I found another note, scrap of notes last week in a set of books. And it, that is the sort of crazy thing about this collection. But there are the really unexpected things, including what we found in his copy of Plutarch that he used to read to John Quincy Adams over the breakfast table while they were in Europe. When John Quincy was a teenager, I, I, that poor kid, he never had a chance. Can you see what the outline is? There's a very faint outline that you may or may not be able to see of what was in that book until we took it out. Leaves. We found 14 separate tree leaves that had been in the book so long that literally the color has migrated from the leaf and the imprint of each leaf has, has um, endured on that page. That's the magical stuff. I mean, it is how many of us have shoved things into books and forgotten about them and only they've come across, holy cow, who knew I put that there? And for the Adams Library, it's not the... It is not the content, uh, the printed content is certainly important to the Adamses, um, but it is where those books fit within their lives that really, I think, tell the absolutely extraordinary story. Um, one volume that certainly looks a lot rattier than one might expect when you read about it in your history book, you assume that Thomas Paine's common sense, that's Paine on the right, Adams thought he was a, well, we won't go into the exact, he called it a crapulous mass, if you can, if, uh, that is appropriate to say on TV, right? <laughs> Adams liked Paine's call for independence very much. But he was really worried about what Paine was proposing to go in its place. So the notion if you take down a monarchy is one thing. But what are you planning to erect? And Paine's simple form of government was not enough that Adams didn't see that we would just get ourselves into the same mess that we found. It might look a little different, but there would still be governance by the few, governance by the one. It was not going to be governance by the many. And Adams wrote of Thomas Paine. He has a lot, he wrote to Abigail, he has a lot better hand at tearing down than at building. And if you think about that, the tearing down, look at the Middle East today, look at Iraq, the tearing down part doesn't take sometimes very long. And often you get a lot of glory for it. But the building up of something that is stable and something that will endure is a lot harder. And unfortunately, it's not quite as sexy either. And for, Tom, for John Adams, the builder who follows you know, the, the statuesque Washington in the beautiful blue waistcoat on the horse, leading people, leading the charge, it's really hard to be the guy hunched over the desk trying to find out how you can build a government that's going to weather not only their immediate storms, but something that's going to weather 200 plus years later. That is an extraordinary thing. For me, looking at Tom Adams's copy of Thomas Paine's Common Sense, he buys two copies on his way to the Continental Congress. One, um, he keeps, and it's travel stained. It looks like he spilled a bit of sale, uh, tea or something on it. Um, and one he sends home to Abigail so that she can circulate it among her friends. And when you see Common Sense, it's just a small pamphlet. Simple, basic, ephemeral, 
but they pumped out a million of those in the first year alone. And that purpose um, is extraordinary when you think about what it accomplished. We can tell a lot about Adams's when Adams acquires things, sometimes just based on the signatures. The signature at the top is from when he's a young man. The signature at the bottom is when he's in his late 70s. He develops a palsy. His eyes start to go. Even if he doesn't annotate his books with a date, often now I can start to track when he's looking at things, when he's writing at things, based upon how his handwriting looks. There's also great presentation copies and gift copies. Um, the top inscription comes from a Spanish guidebook. Well, if you were to see a book of Spanish roads in John Adams's library, you would say, okay, what gives? No idea why. But when you see an inscription that says it was presented by the American agent in Spain in 1779, and you remember that Adams's boat sprang a leak, and they couldn't make it to France, so they had to dock in Spain instead, and he had to go overland with those two kids and he's sick, and the kids are sick, and he's on the back of a donkey, and he's just having a miserable time, and he's got this Spanish book of, well, this Spanish guidebook in his hand. All of a sudden, the context makes a lot more sense. And that period, that way that we put the Adams, uh, the Adams books into context, that really is a tremendous amount of fun. There's also connections that we have. Um, this is a book, Life of George Washington, by Chief Justice John Marshall inscribed to John Adams, Mr. Adams is requested to accept a copy of the life of Washington as a sincere mark of the respect and attachment of his obliged and obedient servant, the author. You can get copies of life of Washington now. They're not rare. You probably, they're probably even still in print somewhere. This is just paper. It's just ink. But when you realize that it's Chief Justice John Marshall whom Adams installed on the Supreme Court inscribing this book about Washington to Adams. All of a sudden you have this triumvirate of some really key prime movers in the early republic and the books don't become about the printed content anymore as much as they become about relationships, about um, not only sort of past political history, but where those friendships would lead, how, how these books come into his collection, books that were bound for him. Um, the books themselves start, take, start following the, charting the life of their owner, but they also tell more than any of the previous pieces, whether they were letters, diaries, or whatever, could tell alone. This, I wish you could see how beautiful this book is. It's a really deep red. It's a deep red Morocco. Um, it's got Adams's crest embossed on the front cover. It's beautifully gilded. Um, the interior of the book, it's a folio. Um, the interior of the book, the margins, the text block is only about this wide, and the margins are almost twice the size of the text block. That's a luxurious thing. You don't waste paper like that unless you're doing a fancy, creating a fancy book. It's also the first time the Great Seal of the United States ever is shown in a printed book. This is a book that was printed by Benjamin Franklin in 1783. It includes the Articles of Confederation, the Declaration of Independence, and the 13 state constitutions. There were only 100 copies of this printed. And Franklin printed it to hand out to the French king, the French queen, the French ministers, and some uh, others at the court, because we're about to sign the Treaty of Paris. And this is Franklin's way of saying, we are about to become a new nation. These are our laws. Adams gets a copy, which is interesting as well. Adams is there at the time. He and Franklin, uh, as many of you know, had a contentious relationship. There are very few copies of this survive. An antiquarian bookseller, I asked just off the cuff, how much would a copy like this go for, assuming that it's not even Adams's? And he said, mm, I would probably conservatively say about a quarter of a million dollars. It's just a book. But it is a book like no other book. And that is something that we have to be very cognizant of. Um, it's also one of the first books where Adams, you remember his old book plate when he was in Quincy? Look at the new fancy diplomatic book plate. Someone is quite full of himself now. He has this created while he's in London. Um, it's got, he's appropriated his mother's, the Boylston family's coat of arms and modified it. There are the 13 stars around it. There's this wonderful Latin prescription from Tacitus essentially saying, hold fast to friendship, liberty, and faith. 
It has Fleur de Lis representing his embassies in uh, France, as well as Lyons representing embassies in England and Holland. And all of a sudden, you see a man who is essentially constructing himself, someone who is not to the manner born, but has constructed that based upon his reading and his accomplishment. What a particularly American thing to do. But it's not just the highfalutin stuff. You also have a guy who gets bored probably on wharves and doesn't have anything to do. I mean, he, he's in Europe for 10 months and is shipping out all over the place. And you just know those boats weren't speedily moving him on, so he's doing a lot of waiting. He doodles in his books. It's wonderful. It's wonderful to see these things. You don't expect to see these kind of things in, quote, the library of a president. And notice I'm very careful not to say presidential library. Because technically, it's not. A real presidential library, as dictated by the National Archives and Records Administration, is not a president's personal books. It is the records of the administration. It was um, first initiated with Franklin Delano Roosevelt. So we get around it by calling it the personal library of a president. People all still call it a presidential library, and I don't say anything. I try not to roll my eyes. I just sort of sit there and smile gracefully. But it is something that, that Nora gets a little prickly about, we tend not to, and there is something about it um, that does strike true. It feels presidential when you're with these books. Um, oh, I just, I, well, I missed that. So we also have documents of when books came into Adams's library, how much he paid for them. Then there's the crazy stuff. You expect books from the 1700s and 1800s. You don't expect books from 1514. I mean, think about that. That book was alive, if you can call a book alive, which I totally do. So if you don't, don't say anything, because that would really hurt my feelings right now. This book was alive for 250 plus years before it ever met John Adams. This book, the first printing, the, the Gutenberg Press is in the 1450s. Those first 50 years of printing from, the, from 1450 to 15, essentially 1501, are what those books printed during that time are what are known as incunabula or incunables, literally the cradle of printing. Well, this misses that only by 14 years. This is a book of all things of Italian archaeology. And this engraving, I mean, what life was like when that engraving was created that has Vesuvius in the middle, Pompeii a little bit off to the right, and the book itself is about Nola, which is a dig site, the first book known to be at an ar about a, an Italian archaeological dig site other than Rome. It's pretty neat to find stuff like that in Adams's library. Jefferson was not the only one who liked architecture. Granted, this might be the only architecture book that's in Adams' library, but still, he had an architecture book, so I'm going to rest on that wall. And the one thing you should know is it was an expensive book, um, but you should also notice how careful he is when he's making his notations uh, not to write over the middle portion where you can see the plate on the subsequent page because the ink might migrate through and ruin the, ruin the plate on the subsequent side. Adams has eight languages in this library. Eight. English, not surprisingly. Greek and Latin from his early studies on. French, which he teaches himself on board ship, basically, on his way in his 40s to serve as diplomat. A little bit of German. Quite a bit of Dutch, because he, spent, he opened the first American embassy anywhere at The Hague. A little bit of Italian and a little bit of Spanish, including a copy of Don Quixote that he bought to keep himself company on that horrible Spanish trip. This particular volume features both French and Italian. There are surprises. You don't really expect a farmer in the, riddle, in the middle of Braintree, Massachusetts in the early 1800s to have a copy of the Quran, but he does the first American edition. He reads widely and deeply in all matters of religion. And he's, I never get the sense that he's que questioning his faith at all. But his feeling is the more he knows, the, frankly, his feeling was that any religion should stand up to curiosity. And the more he knows, the better off he is no matter what he's learning about. There are books about Hinduism. There are books about Judaism. There are books where he is learning about, on the one hand, the golden rules of Pythagoras on one side, and then he's reading about the early life of the, the popes and the other. And it's fascinating to see how widely his reading ranges, particularly in his 70s. This is a new acquisition. Seriously. Well, it's not really new. It's kind of an old book. But it's a new acquisition for us. We just bought this a year ago. It's a nine-volume set of Moliere. 
And this particular volume went up for auction, this particular set of volumes went up for auction, and it was known, it says John Adams 1772, and then on the flyleaves it has all these translations in French. They're not commentative ones, just simple translations. And the auction house put it on the market and we bought it for a ridiculous amount of money. I think we spent forty-five or fifty thousand dollars for it. We have a fund for Adam's books. It's still a ridiculous amount of money, but darn it, did we want it. And what people hadn't really done was much research because I think one of my favorite things to say about John Adams is that he never met a piece of paper he didn't feel compelled to write something down on. And if they had dug a little bit more deeply, they would have realized that John Adams took this set of Moliere on board ship. This was the set he taught himself French with. He writes in his diary about using this Moliere, volume six, and reading it and learning from it as often as the winds and British men of war would permit. Can you imagine in your 40s, in the middle, they left the harbor. They couldn't even leave Boston Harbor in 1778 because it was too dangerous. Were he captured, he would have certainly been taken in the Tower of London and hanged. So they leave from a secret spot. He leaves in February. You don't get on a boat in peacetime in February out of Boston. You certainly don't get on it in a war, and you don't get on it with your 10-year-old kid, John Quincy, because you think it's going to be an edifying experience for the little guy. They get into, they, they have all sorts of issues, both with weather and British cruisers. In fact, one of the sailors on board dies um, after a fight. And yet, you still have the same guy sitting here reading this set of books because he's going to a country that he has no idea what it looks like, has no, can't, can't call Abigail. It's not like he's going to say, honey, I got here. Abigail is going to have to wait conservatively three months to know if they made it safely for them to make the crossing and then however fast that ship can get it back to her to know. That is a heck of a long time to know if your husband and your son made it. Um, and yet he does it, and there's something so evocative about sitting with these books, holding them, and realizing that they looked up into his face during that time, and that they were there. They were in that experience. We're still discovering things. Everything from there's the little Cicero on the right. Well, I just had, I just was using this book a couple months ago. No, I hadn't really noticed until all of a sudden you see the John Adams book in the upper right corner. Darn it, if that doesn't look like his early signatures, and it's a Greek and Latin dictionary. I would almost lay, I would lay really good money that this is a book that dates from that Cicero period, and it's nothing that had ever been identified. But the really fun part starts when John Adams goes to town in the margins of his books, because that's what he does. I mean, he is an inveterate annotator. Um, he is someone who starts with, he starts off small. Um, he gets into the habit as a lawyer. Um, this particular excerpt is one of my favorites. This volume is all about, this particular passage is all about the ugly American. It talks about um, essentially someone who is, is just a complete loser. Timid, rude, illiberal, ungraceful, absurd, bigoted, clownish. And John Adams, Harvard class of 1755, writes in the margin an exact description of a Dartmouth-educated scholar. <laughs> And it's those moments, we call this exhibition John Adams Unbound for a reason. There is that unfettered quality to him. Um, you see even where he has notes, the paper before the book itself was bound, he has notes that fold up and around in it. He gets into the real spirit of annotating probably when he is in his early 60s. So, uh, vice president and then as president, and it's really when he enters retirement and has all of that time on his hand and a lot of strong feelings that he doesn't, that he doesn't believe have been represented, that he really gets going. But we have everything from this beautiful image of this Egyptian pagan ritual and Adam's writing in the bottom, is this religion? Good God. Which is a wonderful commentary to where he literally dwarfs poor Mary Wollstonecraft in her historical and moral view of the French Revolution. Adams didn't like her um, on a personal level. He thought that she led a very licentious life. He certainly didn't like her on a political level. She was part of the English radical, the sort of philosoph crowd that believed that, frankly, um, the less government, the better, that if you could, that you could rely on the perfectibility of man and pure reason to form a government. And Adams, the practical New England farmer, thought she was a complete idiot and told her so in the margins. He writes 10,000 words in the margin of 
her historical and moral view of the French Revolution. 10,000, and the best part for me is that he reads it through not once, but twice. There's a whole series of annotations that are dated 1796. The French Revolution is still raging. Adams knows people on both sides of the guillotine. And he is warning, be careful what you wish for. Not that revolutions are bad, but what do you have going in its place? He reads it again in 1812, cover to cover, and re-annotates. And guess who's in the power? Welcome to your new emperor, Napoleon. Congratulations, France. See how you didn't set up a strong system of checks and balances? Told you. And it is really interesting to see that layer on it, in addition to not only that what's happening in France, but you have Adams' own layers. And that's what I love about a book. It's funny talking to people about books who think about them as static objects. It's sort of like book collectors who look at books that when it is printed, when the, when it, when the press is done and the book is bound, that is the object. It's life. That, that is, it is finished. And if you collect first editions, if you collect rare books, that is what you're interested in. My interest is in the life of the book that I feel just starts on that day. And for Adams, reading, if any of us read a book 10, 12, 20 years apart, even if it is the same physical paper, the same physical ink, it's a really different book because you are different, because the world is different, but so rarely do you actually have proof of that. But to see it in Adams, where he has, you know, he's vice president when he's reading that first run through. But when he reads it through in 1812, he's lost that horrible re-election to Jefferson. He's feeling completely left out. Stupid Washington and Jefferson and Franklin and Hamilton are getting all of this credit. And where is he? Where is he in that pantheon? He's been completely overlooked, and that lens is layered on it as well. And you see it in him taking it out, not in every book, but in the books particularly that get him riled up. Nothing did he love more than an argument. He really loved an argument. And so with Mary Wollstonecraft, um, this is one of my favorite annotations. She's promoting on the final page simplicity in government. And Adams writes in 1796, this word simplicity in the course of seven years, so after the Bastille fell in 1789, has murdered its millions and produced more horrors than monarchy did in a century, as if all excellence and perfection consisted in simplicity. A woman would be more simple would she had but one eye or one breast, yet nature chose she should have two as more convenient as well as ornamental. <laughs> I will not even dignify that, I'm going to move on. A man would be more simple with but one ear, one arm, one leg. Shall a legislature have but one chamber then? No, because it is more simple. A wagon would be more simple if it went upon one wheel, yet no art could prevent it from oversetting at every step. Adam stopped the practice of law 20 plus years before this was written. And yet you still hear, in many ways, the old attorney. You hear the lover of Cicero with the beautiful I mean, the, the beautiful oration, um, the style, the fabulous symmetry, and it's so complete. I mean, when I think of notes in books, I think of little jottings that I make. Page 46, see, you know, crazy, bad, weird, um, true. But for Adams, this is really fully fledged thought. He loves this so much, he continues it on in other portions of the, of the volume. A watch with one hand, a house with one room, a barn with one stall. And it's really, I mean, it, there is a humor to it, but they're all, he's right. I mean, you realize he is the most careful reader I know of. Um, he lets nothing escape his grasp. And he's reading at a time before electricity, before good central heating. It gets dark. Well, I guess it gets dark here early, too. It gets dark in Boston at this time at 4 o'clock in the afternoon. He's running a farm. And yet, and yet. He's finding the time not only to read, but to reflect and to think. So the final things I want to show you are things that you can see when you're done exploring this exhibition. Um, you can also explore things online. Because one of the great things about being a part of this project in the last decade is darn it if this whole digital world doesn't expand the options to explore the John Adams Library. I mean, you're welcome to come to Boston between 9 and 5 on a weekday. Don't get me wrong, and I will totally welcome you with open arms. But if for whatever reason that's not convenient, uh, then we have all kinds of things that are available electronically. We have a whole website 
that is dedicated to the Adams Library um, called johnadamslibrary.org. And I think it will show up. Why does it keep doing this? <gasps> there it is. It's thinking. Um, and there, there are some neat things. You can certainly search the collection. The one thing I want to show you is that we have this really, whoa. Sorry, I'm not doing a very good job driving. I have to look this way. We have this really neat timeline that enables you, if you're just interested in browsing and playing with the collection, which frankly I like to do very much, um, you can look through in the course of Adams' life, sorry it takes a little bit to load, um, we've divided his books up into five phases, um, from his early years, through the revolutionary period, through his years as a diplomat, um, into his executive office years and retirement. Well, for each of those, you can go through, and for instance, the little Cicero that I showed you before, you can click on it here, and it will tell you a little bit more about it, but what it also will do is let you page through a few pages. And you can read about it. When I created an exhibit, I was shocked to learn that people don't actually read 500 word labels. So all of the research that I had done apparently was not going to go over well when I put them. So I had to put it somewhere, heaven forbid. So a lot of that information is here. So that's, really, that's very cool and very exciting um, for you to explore. But what I think is even more compelling is that we have, as of August of 2007, started to digitize the complete Adams Library with a grant from the Sloan Foundation. We have made digital copies cover to cover of nearly 2,000 of those volumes. It's amazing. And what is amazing to me is with the Internet Archive, we have a scanning center on site. Um, and what I really find incredible is not only, so this is the Adams Library site, but let me actually take you to this particular book. Um, this book is um, a book of about the American Revolution that was published in 1788 by William Gordon. These are Adams's notes in the margin. Um, in particular, Adams takes umbrage with the fact that Thomas Jeff Adams is listed as the first subscriber and as the American plenipotentiary. If you turn to Thomas Jefferson, <sighs> it says His Excellency Thomas Jefferson Esquire, American Ambassador, Paris. Now, Adams was there longer and arguably did more. And Jefferson gets to be called the fancy title, and Adams is stuck with plenipotentiary. So Adams writes in the margin, how happened it that Jefferson was an ambassador and the first subscriber only a minister? Oh, history, how accurate thou art. <laughs> no sour grapes there. He's totally recovered. Totally fine. So it's really cool to be able to see that. There is a, one shot of it in the, in the fame section back there. But what I wanted to show you here, and then I promise I'm almost done. I swear I'm almost done with John Adams. Is that there is also now, through the magic of technology and the Internet Archive, the ability to take this book at 2 o'clock in the morning in your bunny slippers at home and page through everything. You can Zoom. You can download the whole thing to your computer. You can print certain pages. You can do a uh, um, search for keyword terms. It's a little tricky because, unfortunately, this is in that period with the elongated S's. So the optical character recognition is having a little bit of a tough time with that. But even so, the miracle to me is that this book is available now worldwide. We started scanning these books two years ago. We're at almost 2,000 copies. Uh, 2,000 volumes that are done. Uh, I told the group this morning, if we had five, seven researchers a month in our rare books reading room using Adam's stuff, that's pretty good. Those books have been downloaded over 350,000 times. And the thing that is most humbling to me is it's not the stuff I thought that people were going to use that are the most popular. It's some of the most bizarre things. Everything from dictionaries, the Greek and Latin stuff is really hot. The early English common law books have been downloaded thousands of times. I mean, who can even read this stuff? And yet, you know, Thomas Paine's Common Sense, sure, it's been downloaded a few hundred times. But it is the most humbling to me, but it's also really, frankly, gratifying to me. If you free the stuff, 
people will use it. And I have now tried to take myself back. You know, you talk about curator and being custodian, but sometimes you also, oh, that was brilliant, Beth. Um, sometimes you also have to take the step back and say, maybe if I just provide people access, they can make the decision for themselves. So the final thing I will leave you with is an assignment. And the assignment is related to bookmarks. Claudia, do you have them? Are they back there? They are, in, they are available here, which we created for this traveling exhibition because we thought they were cute. They're little pictures. They're John Adams's head. It includes the John Adams Library website on the back. Um, and we thought they were darling. What we didn't know is that there would be this rogue movement that people would start taking him places, kind of like Flat Stanley, and start <laughs> shooting him all over the world. So, He's in, Th that's Thailand in the upper left corner. Claudia took him, I should have put it up there. Claudia took him, he was in Tiananmen Square. Can you imagine Adams in Tiananmen Square? He would have gotten a huge kick out of that. He's in Puerto Rico, there he is at the Mall of America. Uh, if any of you know Mickey's Dairy Bar in Wisconsin, there he was. There he is in the middle one down there at the Library of Congress visiting Thomas Jefferson's library. Um, I won't note here that I then got, thro I got thrown out of the Library of Congress for taking that picture because apparently you're not supposed to use flash in that uh, area, but it was fine. I got my shot. <laughs> so the great thing is that there is a blog which is available from the front page of the Adams website and, and most weeks new pictures come in from all over now. And the fact that we've been sending them, he's been to Cuba, um, which has been absolutely extraordinary. And we have, so, oh look, he's been to the beach now. Let's see if I can get this. Yeah, so there he is at the beach. Oh, look how cute he is, he's a little pale. <laughs> oh, there he is in a mill, there he is in, a, in London, apparently. Oh, there are a whole bunch of them in that shot. I don't know if you guys can see it. Oh, he's at Bryce Canyon. Wonder how he liked that. That wig must be hot. Um, oh, he's, a, he's on a sugar beet farm in Minnesota. Who knew? Um, he's at a lighthouse in South Carolina. Oh, there is with a space needle in Seattle. So the funny thing is, people have been just taking, it takes a little doing, because you have to hold the shot, you have to get his little head kind of in perspective with the rest of it, but there are some, and it's not necessarily where he is, um, but there have just been some absolutely hysterical shots been taken uh, all over the world. So the final thing is, so I've shown you all kinds of things. I've shown you what it looked like in our exhibit hall. You can see the exhibition here. Um, one of my favorite areas is the library well itself because you can actually spine read. There are individual openings, um, but what I thought that you couldn't get unless I was here because I'm the curator so I can get away with these things is I bought an Adams book. Yes, I got insurance for it. So that copy of William Gordon's History of America where Adams complains about Jefferson's being an American ambassador and poor Adams only a minister. This is the real page. You're welcome to come up afterwards and see it. I'm happy to show it to anyone. There's also this great map of the US as it exists in 1788. Um, Iowa, not shockingly, uh, doesn't get, it is on the map in Concept, you do get a river, but you also get a note underneath that says basically country full of mines, which I think is very interesting. Um, you know, the digital stuff is amazing. It really is. And the fact that people all over the world can work with these books, extraordinary. There is a magic to the fact that this was there, that you cannot escape either, that it is, that it is the witness I was talking about. And you know, we have a real responsibility to this. Um, we have a responsibility, however, to let people know that this exists. So with that, I will end here, but I would be happy to accept any questions.
makes me so proud. One more for John Adams. I feel like I have a convert. It's so exciting. <laughs> yeah. Uh, are there any of the books that show the influence of what his wife would have purchased? And also, are there any amount of fiction in so there are two questions. The first is, are there any books that Abigail would have purchased? And the second uh, asks whether there's any fiction in the library. So the first is, that library was John's, and it was always John's. That said, there are two volumes that have Abigail's signature in them. She would not have put her name in them, but she read from that library extremely heavily. Um, she was always custodian of it. I mean, he was traveling a ton, so she was really the caretaker. And you can tell from her letters, she quotes from at least 50 of the volumes that are in that collection. So she was not only looking out for it, but she was using it. Um, she was also uh, responsible for the children's education, and he would send her literally massive book lists um, that she was supposed to acquire for the kids and go over with them. As far as fiction is concerned, there's not a lot. Um, and the reason that there isn't a lot is you have to remember that this is a library that was meant for a school. When Adams gave these books, he also gave land for a school that was to be built, the Adams Academy. And that school, the books that would have gone in, it would have had to have been the edifying ones. They are not going to be the works of popular fiction. You're not going to give away the personal family books. You're not going to give away the Bible. And anything that was, Adams definitely read um, some of the popular fiction of the day, but I don't think he would have believed in this case, for this library, that it would have been appropriate um, to be giving to young men, because of course that school at that time would have been exclusively for men, for them to read. In the back. Before he gave away his books, where did he keep it? The Adams Library, until he retired in 1801, the books were never together as a whole. Because if you think about it, from the time that he goes in the early 1770s to the Continental Congress, until, so he's in Philadelphia for a lot of that time. Um, then he goes to Europe for 10 years. Then he goes to, uh, then he serves not only as vice president under Washington, but then opens as the first White House in Washington, D.C. He always has pieces of his library with him, but the library in total never comes together until his retirement um, after he loses to Jefferson. At that point, the books are literally scattered all over the house. A lot of them were stored. There used to be an outbuilding behind the family home. Um, it was literally a farm building. When he got older, he made his poor grandson, George Washington Adams. Imagine, as you can imagine, that family name didn't go over very well with John when uh, he heard what the choice for the new grandchild was. Um, he made George Washington Adams go get uh, the books for him. He never had a great scheme of keeping, like Jefferson has, has an incredibly detailed, meticulous scheme for both tracking his books and for organizing his books. Adams was not, was not him, his way at all, and yet you get the feeling that he knew where his various books were, but we can't determine any scheme. The organizational scheme we have now at the library, I believe, is one that was imposed much later um, by the, probably the library in Quincy that held it before we did. then I would invite anyone who would like to come up and uh, see the Adams book is welcome to do so, but I would like to thank you all so much for coming. Thanks.